Hello everyone, CardioMind's channel and with another specific disease and very famous to cause ventricular arrhythmias which is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. First of all, what do we mean by this terminology? We mean increased LV wall sickness not explained by abnormal loading conditions like uncontrolled hypertension or valvular disease like severe aortic stenosis. So there is no evidence that it is a secondary hypertrophy, no, it is a primary disease. From this famous diagram, we can see that most of the episodes are exercise induced and monomorphic is much more common than polymorphic VT. And usually the age of incidence is between 30 to 50 year old. In adults, its prevalence ranges from one in 500, while in children, it is much lower in incidence regarding the prevalence and regarding the incidence of sudden cardiac death as well. So hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is more common than the ARVC, which occurs in 1 in 1,000 to 1 in 5,000 adults. The most famous cause for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is the sarcomeric gene mutations, which represent 40 to 60 percent of all the cases, mostly due to autosomal dominant inheritance. That's why genetic testing in the index patient and as well cardiac screening in first degree relatives are indicated in peril because it is very common to see the disease in the first degree relatives due to the autosomal dominant inheritance. From this table published in the 2014 EC guidelines, which was specified to discuss hypertrophic cardiomyopathy per se, we can see a lot of sarcomeric gene mutation. But the most important one are these, which are myosin 7, myosin binding protein C, troponin T, troponin I, and tropomyosin alpha 1 chain, which are the most common sarcomeric gene mutation to be seen in the genetic testing. But remember, the sarcomeric gene mutation are the most common cause, but there are other causes that represent 5 to 10% of cases, like inborn errors of metabolism, like Bombay disease, Danone disease, or carnitine disorder, or Fabry disease, neuromuscular disease, mitochondrial, malformation syndromes like Nonan syndrome, amyloidosis, newborn of a diabetic mother, and drug-induced hypertrophy. We should put these causes in our mind when we think of a case. And in the 2014 guidelines, we can see a lot of specific information regarding the etiology, pathogenesis, the ECG features, and the echo features. I will put the link for these guidelines in the description below the video. In this example, we can see in the resting ECG that there are asymmetrical T wave inversion from V2 to V6 and in the inferior leads. Sometimes there are voltage criteria of left ventricular hypertrophy, but not in all cases. And during VT, we can see here due to epical LV origin that it show right bundle branch block morphology with superior axis. And in the CMR, there is evidence of epical aneurysm with late gadolinium enhancement. So in the 2022 guidelines, the recommendations for diagnosis are the CMR with late gadolinium enhancement as the degree of the LGE correlates with the risk of ventricular arrhythmias and sudden cardiac deaths. Genetic counseling and testing are recommended in all patients and also the first degree relatives should have ECG and echo in order to detect the disease early. And remember that in the 2014, they put a cascade for the genetic testing in the family members, according to which you have found a definite mutation in the index patient or it is still unknown. And remember, please, that in the first degree child relatives aged more than 10 year old, the genetic status, if unknown, in this case, we need to repeat the ACG and echo every one to two years between the age of 10 to 20, and then every two to five years due to the age related penetrance. It doesn't mean that if the ACG and echo are normal, in a child or a teenager that they are not affected because sometimes the disease may be manifest later in adolescence. Regarding the prognosis, the annual mortality is about 1-2% to in most studies and the annual rate of sudden cardiac deaths or appropriate ICD therapy is about 0.8% depending on the age and the risk profile of the patient. And most deaths related to hypertrophic cardiomyopathy at age less than 60 years occur suddenly Due to ventricular arrhythmias, that may be a consequence of myocardial ischemia, LVOT obstruction, scar-related re-entrant VT, 
or sometimes supraventricular arrhythmia, which is common in patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And older patients usually die from stroke, as atrial fibrillation here is very common, or due to heart failure, either preserved or reduced ejection fraction. We always know that sudden cardiac death in those patients is triggered by exercise, and so the participation in competitive sport has been discouraged. However, recent data suggests that vigorous exercise in some patients who have no risk markers may not be associated with ventricular arrhythmia. So there is a new recommendation in these guidelines that the participation in high-intensity exercise may be considered for asymptomatic adult patients without risk markers, and this depends on the process of risk stratification to decide which patient to participate and which patient is prohibited from high-intensity exercise. And by the way, as we mentioned risk stratification, the main challenge is to identify the relatively small group of patients with the highest risk of sudden cardiac deaths. The most important risk factor is the presence of non-sustained VT, which is usually detected on ampulatory ECG monitoring in 20 to 25% of patients, and the incidence increase with increasing age, LV wall sickness, and late gadolinium enhancement on CMR, and its prognostic value for sudden cardiac death is more important in younger patients less than 30 years. In order to be objective, there is a famous risk calculator published in the 2014 AC guidelines, which is the HCM Risk Sudden Cardiac Death Calculator, and I have put the link in the description below the video, which depends on four numerical values, which are the age, LV wall thickness, left atrial size, and LVOT gradient, and three yes or no question, presence or absence of non-sustained VT, unexplained syncope, or family history of sudden cardiac death. And remember that this risk calculator should not be used in patients with previous VF or sustained monomorphic VT because in this case we are speaking about secondary prevention, not primary prevention. Elite athletes, metabolic or infiltrative disease which represents the 5 to 10 percent of the patients or after septal myectomy or alcohol septal ablation because here the LV wall sickness will not be reliable. There is a specific risk score for children called the Risk Kids Score, and also the link is present in the description, which was externally validated specifically for those aged 1 to 16 years of age, including those parameters which are the unexplained syncope, maximal LV wall thickness, left atrial diameter, LVOT gradient, and non-sustained VT. But remember that in contrast to adults, the age and family history of sudden cardiac death did not improve the accuracy the score so they were not included and this score excluded patients with prior VF or sustained VT the same as in adults and patients with known inborn errors of metabolism or syndromic causes because of course here the incidence is much more common in children in comparison to adults. Before the current guidelines of 2022, the last one to discuss the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy were the 2015 AEC guidelines for ventricular arrhythmias and sudden cardiac deaths. They issued that every patient should have the risk sudden cardiac death calculator to assess his or her risk of sudden death at 5 years if they are aged more than 16 years, but they should be without a history of resuscitated VT or VF or hemodynamically unstable VT. They stated that if the score is more than or equal 6% and life expectancy more than one year, it is class 2A to put an ICD. If the score between 4 to less than 6% and life expectancy more than one year, it is class 2B. And if the score is less than 4%, but the patient having clinical features of proven prognostic importance, it is class 2B. And in each one, we should assess the impact of ICD on the patient's lifestyle, socioeconomic status, and psychological health. Is there any update in the 2022 guidelines regarding primary prevention? They also confirmed that the five-year risk of sudden cardiac death should be assessed at first evaluation and at one to three-year interval. So it is not just assessment at the first time, but you should have repeated assessment because sometimes the patient may have a change in his parameters regarding the numerical values or the clinical factors. And if there is any change in the clinical status, you should reassess the risk calculator.
In the 2022 guidelines, they put some specific additional risk factors for those with intermediate or low calculated risk. For example, LV systolic dysfunction, which occurs in the burnout out stage, LV apical aneurysm in the echo or in the CMR, abnormal blood pressure response during an exercise test, extensive late gadolinium enhancement on CMR more than or equal 15% of LV mass, and one or more detected sarcomeric G mutation. Remember that ventricular arrhythmia induced by programmed electrical stimulation was considered non-specific. So the indication for primary prevention ICD in the current guidelines is the risk score in adults is more than or equal 6% or more than or equal also 6% in children between the age of 1 to 16 year olds. If the score is between 4 to less than 6%, it is class 2A if the patient is having significant late gadolinium enhancement at CMR more than or equal 15%, ejection fraction less than 50%, abnormal blood pressure response during exercise, LV apical aneurysm, or presence of sarcomeric pathogenic mutation, the same additional risk factors which we have discussed shortly. And we define here the abnormal blood pressure response as failure to increase systolic blood pressure by at least 20 mm mercury or fall of more than 20 from the peak pressure. If the patient is having a score between 4 to less than 6% without any additional risk factors, the class of recommendation is just 2B. And if the score is less than 4%, but the patient is having significant late gadolinium enhancement or LV ejection fraction less than 50% or epical aneurysm, it is just class 2b. Back to the 2015 guidelines, they issued the secondary prevention ICD as class 1 for those who survive the cardiac arrest due to VT or VF or have spontaneous sustained VT with hemodynamic compromise and life expectancy more than one year. In the current guidelines, they issued also an indication as class 1 for patients who survived hemodynamically not tolerated VT or VF and class 2a in those presenting with hemodynamically tolerated sustained monomorphic VT. As we remember, this is the same indication as in patients with dilated or arrhythmogenic RV cardiomyopathy. And reminding ourselves that the most common documented ventricular arrhythmia subtype is a sustained monomorphic VT, where ATB is successful in about 69 to 76% of all episodes. That's why ATB capable devices like transvenous ICD are preferred to reduce the number of essential shocks. What about the role of antiarrhythmic drugs? If the patient is having recurrent symptomatic VT or recurrent ICD therapy, Antiarrhythmic drug treatment is a first line, but remember that so far there are no randomized controlled trials or cohort studies in those patients to support a significant role for antiarrhythmics to prevent sudden cardiac deaths. For example, amiodarone may reduce the ventricular arrhythmia but with conflicting results regarding second cardiac death prevention. Dizopyramide and beta blockers are efficient to control symptoms and to reduce LVOT obstruction, but no evidence on the risk of sudden cardiac deaths. And surgical myectomy or alcohol septal ablation used to reduce the LV wall sickness in patients with dynamic LVOT obstruction did not reduce the risk of sudden cardiac deaths in those with LVOT obstruction. They are just targeted for the obstruction, not for the risk of sudden cardiac deaths. Then it is a second line to think of catheter ablation if the patient is having recurrent symptomatic VT or ICD shocks, if the antiarrhythmic drugs are ineffective, contraindicated or not tolerated. But the outcome after ablation here is inferior compared to other non ischemic etiologies like for example, dilated cardiomyopathy and ARVC in which the catheter ablation was class 2A. Of course, there is a different perspective regarding the treatment of LVOT obstruction, how to diagnose it and how to manage it, which was published in the 2014 guidelines. But in this video, we are focusing on the management of ventricular arrhythmias in those with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So we have reached the end of our video today. And our take home message is that CMR and genetic testing are cornerstone in the diagnosis of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. We should not ignore them. And the key to managing those patients is the risk stratification depending on the risk sudden cardiac death calculator and additional risk factors that should be put in consideration in order to decide whether this patient would benefit from ICD or not.
Thank you very much for watching this video and you can check the reference in the description below the video and wait next week for other miscellaneous diseases that may be causing ventricular arrhythmias.